All right, we are going to uh, get going. So good uh, afternoon, everybody. I'm Sandra Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the School of Public Health at Boston University. And on behalf of everybody at the school, welcome to today's Public Health Forum. So the Public Health Forum is, uh, is a regular forum throughout the year where we welcome speakers who address the conditions that shape health. Our goal is to invite guests who help us better understand how we may improve the conditions that, make health, that create a healthier world. Thank you for joining today's discussion. Now today's talk, really is uh, inspired by one of the biggest public health triumphs of the 21st century. Um, we've had steep declines in tobacco use, and uh, this has shown us how something that was really the status quo and accepted um, not so long ago can be changed through public health intervention. One of the key milestones on this was the 1998 Master Settlement Agreement. This Master Settlement Agreement um, offers many lessons for today. It held tobacco companies accountable, and it created an approach that might be applied to other industries that place profit before health. I actually can think of nobody who's better suited to talk about this than uh, Dean Cheryl Hilton. Dean Hilton is the, is the Dean of the College of Global Public Health at New York University. And before this role, she served as President and Chief Executive Officer of Legacy, which is the premier national foundation for tobacco control. During her time with Legacy, she guided the National, national Youth Tobacco Prevention Program, Truth, which has been credited with helping to reduce youth smoking to near record lows. On a personal note, it's always fun to invite a fellow Dean to the school. Um, uh, Dean Hilton uh, joined, became a dean about a year and a half before I did, and uh, she has consistently been a, uh, a sage source of wisdom and advice whenever I've needed it, which is on a fairly regular basis, actually. Cheryl, it's a delight to have you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back at NYU, which I consider one of the finest institutions in the country and one of the best schools of public health with superb leadership from, guess who, Sandra Galea. It's a mutual admiration club here. Uh, today, I'm going to consider with you the potential um, for uh, AGs and public communication to really reshape the way corporations are able to interfere with human health. Um, I'm going, to, I've never given this talk before, I, it's, uh, you're the, you know, initial spin I'm taking it on. Um, and it's, uh, it, it was an eye-opener for me because I was delving into areas, uh, some of which I know less about than others, and I was trying to create a, a, a sufficient contrast to talk about what was the master settlement all about and how might it work for other industries. And I would preface it, preface before I move into it, I would just say, as I said to colleagues of, of about an hour ago, 40 years ago, if you were to tell someone, a governor, for example, that there would be a $246 billion settlement that would pay out that much money and more in perpetuity in order to punish the tobacco industry for their behavior, they would feel your forehead. So that's an important, I think, historical perspective going into the basic discussion about how the highest law enforcement officers of the land within states can, should, will, may play a role in um, helping us roll back um, some epidemics that haven't moved at all and ones that are uh, rising fairly exponentially. So uh, before we move on, I do want to wish you a happy Valentine's Day and thank you for being here on this day. And I thought uh, my, my chief communications person, uh, uh, associate dean at the school, um, came upon a fast food etch valentines for three-year-olds. So I thought I'd pass them around so you can understand what's really going on out there. This is a little company in Minnesota that, as it describes on its website, supports uh, nutrition for uh, schools. So you can look at what the kindergartners are giving out to their uh, loved ones as we um, move on through the talk. I'm going to start by um, spending about four PowerPoints just making sure we understand the master settlement agreement between the tobacco industry and uh, the attorneys general. And as I talk about it, it's only about three or four slides, they're a little wordy, um, I want to challenge you to think about what those provisions might look like for um, the pharmaceutical and, frankly, pharmacy industry with respect to opioids, uh, the gun industry and the NRA with respect to gun violence, and the sugar-sweetened beverages slash fast food industry. Now, those are the three I've picked in addition to tobacco uh, for a variety of reasons that I hope will come, 
become apparent as I move through the talk. But you could have picked alcohol. I could have picked alcohol. You could have picked traffic uh, fatalities. You could pick global climate change. And there is a group of lawyers presently working on precisely that to try to do to tobacco, I mean, do to, to, to the fossil fuel industry. Uh, what was done to tobacco and, and maybe uh, take it a little bit further. So what happened on November 23rd, 1998, is that 46 states, five territories, and five, the five largest tobacco companies uh, settled in a major settlement that, through which states gave up their ability to make future claims against the tobacco industry. Though it did allow individuals to continue to make claims, we could have a whole talk on the status of that at this point, but it's not easy to prevail on that, and I know a few who have ever actually collected. Maybe there's someone here who does. Um, the tobacco industry was required to make payments in perpetuity to these settling states to compensate them for tobacco-related costs that were already incurred by the states. That's an important provision. Imagine it in relation to other things, because it does not, in and of itself, provide an opportunity to direct money elsewhere. Um, four states had settled separately, Miss, uh, Mississippi, Texas, Florida, and Minnesota. Minnesota, in particular, was an extremely important settlement, because it, it is the one that first brought the one secret tobacco documents to light that really became the smoking gun, along with the presence of a whistleblower, Dr. Wigand, uh, from RJR, who um, risked his career and his entire uh, future financial viability uh, to speak out. The MSA is a private agreement, and an additional 40 companies have since joined since it was passed. That is because they are deeply incentivized to do so. If they don't join, they can be, uh, they can be subjected to litigation that they otherwise are relieved from by joining, but they do have to pony up a lot of money. So $4.5 billion a year in 2000, and in the most recent year, $9.5 billion was paid out through that settlement, in addition to special bonus payments for the, uh, for the state AGU's offices that bore the greatest brunt of the cost of bringing this case in the first place. What does it prohibit or restrict? Direct and indirect marketing of youth, including the use of cartoon characters. It buried Joe Camel. The creator of Joe Camel wanted to bury Joe Camel tried relentlessly to bury Joe Camel, which he did as a one-off, never knowing it would become the icon it became, but the AGs were able to do that. Outdoor ads, not in direct proximity to tobacco sales. Outlets, no longer allowed, that's billboards. Product placement in entertainment media, that is being circumvented, I believe, in multiple ways. So these are not ironclad and these are not perfect agreements. Distributing free samples, particularly to kids. Branded merchandise. Philip Morris had branded toys all over Africa, branded clothes that say Marlboro baby in size, you know, newborn. Those are no longer being produced, but there's so much out there. I, I, heaven only knows how long it'll take to flush through the system. Lobbying against particular brands of tobacco control legislation and various administrative rules. Principally, the AGs made certain that the tobacco industry could not sign the agreement and then try to get out of the agreement in various ways, though nonetheless they have, and we'll get to that in a minute. Suppressing health-related uh, research. The agreement says they can't do that anymore. They cannot make material misrepresentations against health consequences of using tobacco. Think of some other corporations right now today and what they are saying about their products. Uh, it created a public health foundation that was known in the first agreement as the MSA Foundation, then named the American Legacy Foundation, then the Legacy Foundation, then Legacy, and now the Truth Initiative. So it's had lots of names over time. Um, it dismantled the Center for Indoor Air Research, the Tobacco Institute, and the Council for Tobacco Research, and it prohibited similar organizations from being formed again. Um, soon after the settlement happened, a very similar organization began to be formed in Europe, and the attorneys general, as I understand it, worked directly with their equivalents in Europe to try to put immediate pressure on that or entity to not be able to come into being. I actually wonder whether the new foundation for a smoke-free world might itself be the beginnings of a violation. And I have an opinion. I've talked to a few AGs. We will, time will tell. Um, the agreement also funded a large, well-funded center at NAG, 
uh, called the Tobacco and Public Health Center now that is in charge of defending the MSA and making certain that the tobacco industry does not undermine its provisions. The states, sadly, are not required to spend any MSA funds to address tobacco or, for that matter, any other purpose other than the purposes for which they wish to spend it. That is indeed the fatal flaw in the agreement. The talking points are clear. Every time you ask people in high places, they will say to you, well, we're not in the business as AGs of appropriating the money for a state. Um, and the, the next, please ignore the next slide. There are a couple typos in it, so I will just tell you the main take home point. Uh, of all the money that goes uh, to, for, for 2015, 25.6 billion went to the states. For all the money that goes to the states, on average, only between 1 and 3 percent has been spent for tobacco control. 20 percent would need to be spent for tobacco control in order to meet the minimum per capita CDC recommended threshold. So if you think of that as kind of a benchmark, if they had been willing to give up one dollar of every five, we would have an entirely different situation potentially in the United States. In essence, the United States smoking rate would have probably followed the pattern of uh, California, which was a much more accelerated decline than the rest of the country. The cost of paying uh, for all of this was passed on to consumers almost entirely. And the result, at least initially, though this washes out over time, is that it curbed use, but it may have led to other consequences I do not have time to cover. One of the things that was created, and frankly, if you think about it, now that I've given you that little overview, one of the only things that was created that guaranteed to do something substantive about the public's health with respect to tobacco directly, as opposed to indirectly, was the creation of the foundation. I'm often asked, I was asked again today, why did I take that job? If you asked me after I left it, I'd probably say because I was out of my mind, but at the time, how often do we get the opportunity to put into play um, literally a billion and a half plus dollars um, to address a public health problem? You just don't get that opportunity very often. Um, if you do get an opportunity as a foundation president, you usually have multiple constituents, constituencies and multiple problems that you're trying to work on simultaneously and not that kind of money. When they set us up, and I read the documents carefully before I accepted the job, I, I read this thing that's right in front of you now, and I said to myself, hmm, <laughs> this is going to get interesting because what exactly is vilification? Um, if you are not lying, are you vilifying? So what you couldn't do, it created two funding streams, and I'm going to show you a graph in a minute so you can see exactly how that money came in, because I actually think this is probably the most important thing to clone in the, in the um, current discussions that are happening with respect to the op opioid producer industry and their ancillary partners. It, there are other things that should happen, but this, this is one important thing, I think. Um, so we are prohibited from lobbying. The worst fear that the industry had was that we would take all this money and we would achieve some very important objective um, in the federal government that was not in their interest. Second of all, they wanted a way to stop our ads and get them off the air if they didn't like them, which to me would translate uh, if they work. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, they privately claimed that was because the ads that were run um, in the settling state of Florida, which settled ahead of the other states, had been so egregious and so hateful, were the words they used, that they needed to have some mechanism to stop the hate, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then, of course, they, they did, in fact, claim that Legacy's Truth campaign had violated this provision. We were in court by 2001. They sought the return of all funds that not only Laura Lard had paid, because Laura Lard was the uh, other party in the suit, um, but they wanted the closure of the foundation as well. So we want to take all your money and close and claw back any funds that they could claw back. Um, they lost in court at all levels, including the Delaware Supreme Court. But that was seven and a half years later and $17 million of legacy uh, funding later. We recovered about a third of that from our insurers. Had we been incorporated in California, we would have gotten it all back. If you win in California a nuisance suit like this, the people who sued you have to pay you back, is my understanding. Um, but you inherit some other problems by having your uh, entity um, residing in California. 
I will tell you one anecdote because it's an interesting anecdote and it's one that I think we should always remember because a hundred times in my life someone has said to me, you know, they're real you-know-whats, but they're smart. They're not that smart. And I'm going to give you a great example of how they're not that smart. The master settlement agreement was signed between two sets of parties, the tobacco industry, five companies, and 46 AGs and some ancillary AGs. In it, it said that a foundation would be created. Elsewhere in the document, it said that if either party planned on suing one another, that they were required to provide 30 days notice. So arrived on our desk a copy of a letter sometime in early 2001 to the AGs signed by Lorillard Tobacco saying we intend within 30 days, at the end of 30 days, to bring an action against NAG and against um, the Legacy Foundation for its closure. So my attorney, who I love, she just retired, came running into my office and said, this is a stupid mistake because we're not a party to the agreement. They don't have to inform us. And let's make sure we're in Delaware by the time the sun rises for a declaratory judgment against Laurel R. Tobacco Company. That was the absolute turning point. Had they not made that mistake, I believe the foundation would no longer exist because the case was going to the North Carolina courts. And there was, it was determined in Delaware when we won that there was no Supreme Court case. So they shut the industry down for the last step. And the same probably would have happened to us in North Carolina. And, and they would have actually won by that one mistake. This is the cash flow into Legacy. And I show it because I created this slide. And I created this slide because very soon after the foundation was formed, the tobacco industry began running ads about the MSA and how wonderful the MSA was. And aren't we great people because we created it. And look at this fabulous foundation we created. So I decided that we needed to get out in front of that and have people understand that there was a massive cliff in terms of the funding, that we really had to reserve an enormous amount of money if the foundation was ever going to be able to have a long game against youth smoking in the United States. And that was highly controversial. And in fact, the tobacco industry very much wanted to make a case that we could not reserve money, that we had to spend all the money in real time, because they counted on us only having a lot of resources for the five years. And these are things to obviously watch out for. Um, they, in order to counteract the truth campaign, and this will happen, I think, with any other industry, if a master settlement agreement is signed and part of the agreement says the American public, some segment, all of it, kids, whatever it says, need to be thoroughly educated about what your industry has done and how you have compromised the lives of Americans, their response was to immediately launch their own Think Don't Smoke campaign. Um, and it was found by our research and research of others to actually be a, sheep, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, in essence. And so in their internal documents, they knew that. They were worried, and this is a quote, network stopped taking our ads, considered dilutive of ALF ads, meaning they were undermining the campaign by their ads. And in a minute, I'll show you one of them. Um, so we had warned Philip Morris that if they persisted, once we had the research, that the campaign was actually making youth more open to smoking and much more favorably inclined toward the tobacco industry, which is precisely how they were designed, we said that we would go to the network standards and practices and we would accuse them of actually running a PSA campaign that was not a PSA campaign, that was a corporate campaign to, to win the hearts and minds of adolescents. And they um, took the campaign off the air soon after we threatened that. I learned it when I got a call from the Boston Globe asking for my quote about their interview they just granted that they were shutting down. And I just was skipping down the street. I was outside. I was thrilled because I did not think that that was going to happen. Another problem with the MSA that we must think about, whether it's the opioid epidemic or guns or sugar-sweetened beverages or alcohol, is the settlement itself made the states and to a lesser extent legacy when it was receiving the funds dependent on the tobacco industry. 
This perverse incentive was brought in stark relief when 36 states' attorneys general sought to protect the MSA cash flow to the states by filing an amicus brief for Philip Morris to have the bond that Illinois wanted them to set in place to cover a likely uh, successful suit against them, and they succeeded. It was dropped down to some extremely low number, three, uh, three million sticks in my mind. So how does this all connect? So imagine an MSA to address the industries that contribute to these causes of death. They're not all caused by industries, but here are the top 10. Heart disease, cancer, respiratory diseases, accidents, I believe this includes unintentional injury and therefore opioid deaths, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, pneumonia, nephritis, intentional self-harm due to suicide. Right now, for these key epidemics that are driven by sugar-sweetened beverages and fast and poor food, by the behavior of the, of the pharmaceutical industry in relation to the sales, and more on that later, that, they, that the, the basis of the suit against them is an extraordinary read. You need only read the table of contents of the Delaware AG's 14-page table of contents to really get a sense about how many laws, in his opinion, have been violated by this industry um, over the short and long haul. But the numbers in these epidemics are, are important, and they're at important points in their trajectory. For obesity, the estimated number is somewhere between 200 and 300,000 per year. We know there's a debate in the literature about that. Slightly down in under five, fairly stable in, in adults, but not all segments, but not going down appreciably. For drug overdoses, 64K, which is a doubling in less than about seven years, and of that, 44,000 are opioid related. And in terms of guns, uh, gun homicides and suicides, really since 1950, it's been relatively stable with the drug epidemics moving it up and down a bit. Um, economic recession moving it up a bit, but basically it is essentially unchanged, except in the last couple of years it has been once again rising. So we have three epidemics that really aren't moving in the right direction at all, and as Sandro said in the opening, you know, what if we could find a way to, in a sense, accelerate a good direction for these things. What, 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 what would be the elements that would be involved? Well, let's start by just looking at what happened to smoking. Um, it peaked right before the um, MSA was signed. People were very unhappy that 25% of 12th graders were um, smoking, and they were very disturbed that 10% of 8th graders were smoking. And that is one of the things that fueled the settlement talks. And, and yet for adult smoking during the period from 1960 to today, smoking fell from 43% to 15%, a 66% decline. So again, as Sandro said, a real public health success story, though it took a long time. Can that be replicated for other epidemics where, the, where um, industries play an important role? Um, gun violence has declined since the 90s, but again in the last two years has gone up again. Um, and of course, I think we all know this, but just so we're on the same page, 4% of the population is in the United States, but for the personally owned handguns, we have 42% of them. The industry lobbies like crazy with their money to get the policies they want everywhere, but lobbying is not enough. They support politicians who agree with um, their gun policies, which incidentally, by and large, the American public does not agree with, and in fact, the NRA itself, their membership does not agree with. So the NRA supports policies that even its own members do not support, and they do it by their spending. In 1998, they spent $203 million to elect or defeat people based on their position on guns, often a position, again, that the American public does not support nor their membership. For the Trump campaign alone in one year, they spent $103 million. So he Im immediately did their bidding when he was um, in office. The, this just shows the trajectory of um, drug-involved overdose deaths by multiple types, and then all combined, and then a picture 
shows 1,000 words from 1999 through 2014, how quickly this epidemic has burgeoned. And now, enter the attorneys general. They are going to do something. I, there is no question about it. So um, I just, to finish up, because I want to get the, to get the transition here, you all know the situation with respect to obesity. We have very little good news on obesity. We, it, this is the time that we really should try to turn the tide. And I do think that the facts have finally changed around sugar, thanks to one secret documents called the Sugar Papers. So we are at a place that's um, a much better place to be than we were just five years ago. So imagine what an MSA could do. So now we're going to move on away from tobacco and into the world of other epidemics. It could increase the cost of the product indirectly by an industry passing the MSA cost on to consumers and therefore reduce demand. Note I did not mention opioids. I do not think it's a good idea to make them more expensive. More people will be out getting heroin on the street as an alternative to whatever source they have for their pills. Um, mandate state use of funds by saying states can only access funds if X percent is spent on dot, dot, dot. This is somewhat complicated because some state AGs do not have the authority to enter into an agreement that binds the budget process. And it is complicated but not impossible to do this. And in some states it's easy to do and others more complicated. Um, it can fund public education and special programs. And in a minute, I'm going to, going to make the case, which is a case that I actually did not buy entirely when I became the CEO of Legacy, that public education can play a far more important role in this circumstance that we find ourselves in with respect to sugar-sweetened beverages, opioids, and guns uh, than we probably have given it credit for. Um, induce concessions from various industries, whichever one we're talking about at the time, such as marketing restrictions, cessation of efforts viewed as obstructing the public interest, for example, con con uh, creating front groups and false science generation operations, and we can also uh, constrain them with respect to their lobbying against p key public health policies, and in fact, the Master Settlement Agreement has language. It is not strong enough, but it does constrain the lobbying activities of the tobacco industry. It is important to communicate to AGs negotiating any settlement what it should and should not have in it from a public health perspective. And just to be clear about that, in the, with the AGs that I spoke to in advance of, of, of coming here to speak about this today, they said that was one of the biggest problems with the tobacco settlement, that that type of information was too little, too late, and they were very far into the negotiations before they had comprehensive information. There are reasons why that happened, and it's long to explain it, but right now there are settlements, settlement talks beginning related to the 250 cases that have been brought against the opioid industry. They, they met for something like six days. They're meeting again in March. The talks are uh, under the auspices of Judge Pointer in Ohio, and now is actually the time, and I, I just jotted a note off to ASPPH saying we should bring together a group to think this through and get a letter in the right way into the hands of that judge so he has a sense of what the framework should be. Um, why would an attorney general not sue or try to settle with an industry? Well, the most important bullet is the first one. There's not a strong case against the industry with proof of legal violations, so there is no stick. And without a real stick, there can be no carrot, because the industry is not in the business of just giving their money away if they don't have to, and if they do not believe that the threats that law enforcement officers are making about what they will do are um, valid, then they will obviously not settle. Um, the industry is important. Now, again, we're back to the AGs. AGs are politicians. The National Association of Attorneys General was a euphemism. The, 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 everyone says that it stands for the National Association of Aspiring Governors. That is very true. And in that truth, um, they're, they're very skittish about going after corporations that are in their state that involve votes and that involve jobs. Um, they also could be receiving campaign funds directly or indirectly from the industry that is in, not in a good position. Philip Morris is a great example. In order to be certain that they did have the political power that they wanted in every single state, they acquired Kraft. And the one secret uh, documents make it very clear that that was why they acquired Kraft, so that they could have power in, in many, many more states. 
AGs like to do things like this when it's about children. They don't want to tell adults what to do. They're worried about being accused of uh, uh, creating a nanny state. Um, they prefer, whenever possible, to wall off adults. Um, fear of donations by the opposition to their opposing candidate. Very expensive to pursue, especially alone or with a small number of AGs. And actually, there are probably only four states that are in the position, if, unless many others are joining, to actually do the work that brings you to the point of being able to file against an industry. Indiana, New York, California, Massachusetts. You basically need a Democrat and you need one with a big staff. How can an industry fight an MSA? They can sue for you for failure to enfor enforce the MSA, and they did just that to the AGs. They didn't actually file it. They said they were going to file it. They gave them that favorite 30-day notice uh, uh, that we talked about earlier. They can sue collateral organizations. They tried to harass NAG, the National Association of Attorneys General. We were the jewel in their crown by attacking us. They circumvent provisions by offshore companies, Philip Morris International. I believe, I say believe because I don't want to be charged with saying that they do, but I believe that they are paying for smoking in the movies because they're not in the agreement, whereas Philip Morris USA is. Um, and they can argue change circumstances. They can go into court and try to vacate some portions of the agreement. They can harass individuals personally and through the press, and they can exploit poorly written provisions in court. So it's extremely important that the document be well laid out. So this is a famous slide. You've probably all seen it. It just basically maps sentinel events across the um, per capita consumption of cigarettes. And as you can see, again, there was a massive decline in smoking beginning in about 1963 62, 63, with the publication of the Surgeon General's report. So this is a, a busy, busy slide, but we can share it with those who are interested. And as you can see, I just, for our own intellectual exercise, thought, well, what if we had an MSA for guns? What might be some of the provisions that would be possible? And the footnote there that is maybe not that visible to all of you basically says this is a fantasy column because the Lawful Commerce in Arms Act passed by the federal government in, I believe, 2006, if I'm correct, essentially provides no stick for state people to have. So it's hard to envision that it could ever happen. But if we mounted a massive public education campaign to move attitudes markedly in the right direction, the result of that could be much harder on politicians at the federal level to continue to have a bill in place that many, many, and probably most, I could not find any polling data directly on this bill, um, but probably the majority of Americans, once they understand that it relieves them essentially of 99% of all liability, would find that a, a pretty uncomfortable um, thing to be a federal law. So if that were not there, and if you could move people's views, then you could have settlement dollars being passed to consumers who were um, whose lives were damaged from, from guns. You could have the warning labels that California has um, on guns in every state or at the federal level. You can have advertising restrictions. Right now they are out there talking to your children. They're giving them safety lessons. They're inviting them to come lobby in, uh, the, in the federal government, and on and on. Moving on to op opioids, unlike the tobacco has been done, Opioids is in the process of being done. The other two that we're just talking about here are hypothetical, sugar-sweetened beverages and guns. Guns, I'm not going to say how many years away it is. I think if you had unlimited money, it could be a lot sooner rather than later. Sugar-sweetened beverages, on the other hand, I think is more viable because the science that is coming out is beginning to present a pattern that looks more and more like an addictive process related to sugar, especially as it is established in young children. The one secret documents, um, they weren't really secret. They were accidentally left somewhere, and they have been 
partially exploited by uh, Kristen Kearns and Laura Schmidt and will be further exploited, but they tell a terrible story about the sugar, um, about the Sugar Research Foundation, which is now known, known as the Sugar uh, Association, and then another front group they have now, Americans Against Food Taxes, but essentially there's an, there's an almost direct parallel between the behavior of the tobacco industry and the behavior of the sugar-sweetened beverage uh, industry, which is a driver of probably 37% uh, 37, uh, 37 of the excess calories being consumed in this country that is driving the obesity epidemic. And so they are a very appropriate and reasonable target. We talked a little bit about gun industry immunity. Um, it's highly disturbing, obviously, um, but it's um, alive and well. And in order to keep it that way, we're going to start by showing they have a, a spokesperson who's, who's uh, done many ads. Most of them have about a half a million or so uh, YouTube hits. So this is, uh, this is going to take about five seconds to tee it up, but this is, I'm going to show a series of ads by the bad guys and what ads by the good guys would look like. And then I'm going to talk just briefly about what we know about attitudes about these industries and what it would take to make those attitudes move in the direction that would make it no longer possible to do some of the things on a policy level that are happening. They use their schools to teach children. Is a sound issue? They use their movies, films, and singers and comedy shows and award shows to repeat their narrative. Let's see. All to make them march, make them protest, make them scream racism and sexism and xenophobia and homophobia, to smash windows, burn cars, shut down interstates and airports, bully and terrorize the law abiding. Until the only option left is for the police to do their jobs and stop the madness. And when that happens, they'll use it as an excuse for their outrage. The only way we stop this, the only way we save our country and our freedom is to fight this violence of lies with the clenched fist of truth. I'm the National Rifle Association of America, and I'm freedom's safest place. It's a little scary, isn't it? It might be fun to counteract, so we're going to do another one. This is another one also from the NRA. Different spokespeople, I think. <laughs> She'll call 911. Average response time, 11 minutes. Too late. She keeps a firearm in this safe for protection. But Hillary Clinton could take away her right to self-defense. And with Supreme Court justices, Hillary can. Don't let Hillary leave you protected with nothing but a phone. The NRA Political Victory Fund is responsible for the content of this advertising. Okay, and next, um, I guess I have to move it on. Okay, so. Um, I don't like tuna salad, lime beans, or casserole. real ass. Mushrooms look like aliens. Spinach? Not a big fan. They just look like dirty socks. I don't like any of those stuff. Tyson chicken nuggets. They're crispy on the outside. Juicy on the inside, made with 100% all-natural ingredients. Mom, please! They're the one thing kids love, 100% of the time. Thanks, Mom! Now, I, I, showed that, I showed that at the IOM, when it was still called the IOM, uh, and then I happened to sit next to uh, their chief marketing officer at a meeting, and um, I said, you know, I showed one of your ads. She goes, I know who you are, and we, and we took it off the air, and they had. So in that particular case, it just took showing it at an IOM meeting and saying it was despicable. You missed the front, but it went through uh, five or six different vegetables, and each, each kid said how much they hate vegetables. So you know, I presented it as a, OK, this is a food ad for kids and for their mothers, to guilt their mothers, and basically to talk them out of the food pyramid or any appropriate kind of um, eating. This is a classic tobacco uh, playbook ad. It's not an ad, it's just a print ad. Food industry takes a page or two from the tobacco industry. It says sugary drinks don't belong in sport. 
This is part of the strategy. Try to narrow the place where it's not okay, and then it's okay everywhere else. Give up a little ground. This is a think, don't smoke ad, and before we run it, I just want to say that the first set of ads that were put forward to the networks by Philip Morris in this campaign depicted adolescent smoking from beginning to end, and the networks, to their credit, said, you can't be serious, we're not clearing these ads. And they had to go back to the drawing board and come up with a new set of ads that did not really literally and overtly sell cigarettes. So this is their replacement campaign. Hey guys, can I ask you a couple questions? Go ahead, go ahead, all right. Have you ever tried cigarettes? Nope. Why not? I don't know, I just never wanted to, you know what I mean? Really? Yeah, I mean, some of my friends tried it or whatever. Somebody have a pack at the school and, you know, they're smoking or whatever. And do you think they tried it because other people were doing it? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, but that's dumb though. You see what I'm saying? I mean, the reason that it's dumb, not, they're not dumb, but that's a stupid reason to do anything. I feel you. <laughs> So, of course, I, as I mentioned earlier, that was demonstrated to have the opposite effect. Um, this campaign, Mixify, I'm not going to show the ad, but it's a whole series of ads from the sugar-sweetened beverage industry, really making the point, drink as many sugar-sweetened beverages if, as you want, pick water some of the time, pick diet sodas some of the time, but just make sure that you're physically active. And of course, the same issue that is going on with, with tobacco historically, where efforts are made to block all taxes by any means necessary on their product, and block all um, regulation about where one can and cannot use your product is, uh, is similarly happening with respect to soda. Uh, some of you probably know Tom Farley, who was the uh, Commissioner of Health for New York. He attempted to change the portion size along with Mayor Bloomberg. He had no choice but to go for that because there is preemption in New York and you cannot locally tax food or beverages, so they had to go for the size. It flopped, it didn't work, the, uh, the industry poured tens of millions of dollars into blocking it, and he's now in, in Philadelphia, and it looks like he has a, a decent chance of getting it. Um, I'm not going to show this ad either in the interest of time. Not, we're going to move on to the next one, but this is an ad I think you probably have all seen for Movantic. It's a separate pharmaceutical company. I don't believe they make opioids, but the, the script totally normalizes daily, nonstop, almost lifelong opioid use um, with this person who's being portrayed. Um, I'm now going to show the, type, the types of commercials that can be used to counteract that kind of material. And these are, the first three are from the Truth Campaign, and I would just comment, the first one is the first one we ever made. It was body bags piled around Philip Morris's downtown headquarters in New York City. They were not happy. You could write a book about that experience. The second one is when we decided to go in their lobby. Um, they were so upset about that, that ad was taken off the air and created a six-week-long crisis for the foundation, which led Stan Glantz to tell, I think, the Washington Post, quote, legacy has basically destroyed itself. He was essentially correct. And as the neophyte CEO, I had to scramble, get advice, figure out what to do, and how to get our ads back on the air, and the board not appearing to be in the back pocket of Philip Morris. It was extremely problematic, but when you go after these companies with hard-hitting ads, they don't sit back and say, oh, gee, go ahead, feel free. So we're going to show these three and then a few more from other, um, other creative people um, about how one could counteract the impact of these industries in the minds of Americans, particularly their youth, but not, ex not exclusively their youth. So let's run all three of them, one, one after the other. Delivery for the marketing department? Okay, 
you? We have the lie detector because I understand that your company has said that nicotine isn't addictive and then you say that it is, so this is to help an end to all the confusion. Listen, I'm going to have to ask you to leave now. Okay, okay right. we're leaving, Thank but you. your company has said that nicotine Fine. isn't addictive and then you say that it is and we're just trying Wait, to get at the truth. Oh, you're great. This ran in the Super Bowl, and it ran at the time that Philip Morris was running their campaign about how wonderful they were for having signed the MSA and created us. It was a thank you. At Shardzo Glass Freeze Pops, we want you to know where we stand on important glass freeze pop issues. For example, we now agree there's no such thing as a safe glass freeze pop. They are addictive and can cause serious health issues. In fact, one third of the people who enjoy our product will eventually die from shards related ailments. The only proven way to reduce health risks from our glass pops is to not eat them. For more, including information and links on how to help quit our glass freeze pops, visit our website at shardsoglass.com. And remember, shards of glass freeze pops are for adults only. So, um, an enterprising person who calls themselves John Pointer, I think is the name, I can't read it because there's something on it, took a Coca-Cola ad, a real one, and did a voiceover, and this, I'm showing this to you because unlike the NRA ads, and this is one of the secret sauces of public education on the right side of the issue, this ad has 800, uh, 8 million hits on YouTube. So, For a over 125 over. years, we've been bringing people together. Today we'd like to come together on something that concerns all of us, obesity. The long-term health of our families and the country are at stake. And as the nation's leading beverage company, we have played an important role. Across our portfolio of over 650 beverages, we now offer 180 low and no calorie choices. These diet beverages still pose serious health risks. Even though we've reduced the calories per serving, these beverages can still cause kidney problems, obesity, metabolic syndrome, cell damage, and rotting teeth which leaves 470 beverages, which have extremely high, unhealthy levels of calories. Consuming large amounts of rapidly digested sugar in high fructose corn syrup causes a spike in blood sugar and insulin, which can lead to inflammation and insulin resistance, both of which may increase your risk of stroke, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and cancer. Coke has also been known to accelerate aging and cause high cholesterol. The American Heart Association recommends consuming no more than 450 calories from sugar-sweetened beverages per week. The amount in about three cans of soda. Imagine if cigarette companies said they were doing something responsible to protect you. How would you react to that? Beating obesity will take action by all of us, based on one simple, common sense fact. All calories are not the same, and the calories in Coca-Cola products have no nutritional value. If you choose to live a healthy lifestyle, then you should not be drinking any of our products. If you drink Coke, you'll get fatter and fatter. The solution is simple, and it's right in front of your eyes. Don't drink Coke. It's killing you and your family. Coca-Cola. We're partially responsible for America's obesity problem. So he's, uh, <clears throat> that's not really legal, so that's why I don't think it's his name, because it's their real ad. I'm not going to show this ad. It, it's kind of nauseating, but it was Tom Farley's drinking fat ad, trying to get his, uh, trying, uh, many of you I'm sure have seen it. And, and many of you, I think, know uh, the impact of the Truth Campaign, responsible for 22% of the decline in youth smoking during its first four years, 450,000 uh, people prevented from taking up the um, addiction, saving 1.9 to 
$5 billion in medical costs for society after you deduct the $324 million it cost. And this is the story that I really want to leave you with most importantly. I'm going to, in the interest of time, move from this to my last slide. The, but the point, the point I'm making is attitudes can move rapidly unless they're absolute core value hard, hardened attitudes. And I think some of those do exist with respect to guns. I don't think they exist for sugar-sweetened beverages. I don't think they exist for opioids. Most people who are addicted to opioids don't want to be. This was 10 months into the truth campaign. And if you see off to the right underlined, uh, this was the percentage change in the attitude in the right direction. So within 10 months, in a very high and expensive media buy that reached about se initially 75% and ultimately 95% of all adolescents, the change in attitudes moved from about 12% to 26% in some indices, and they're important indices. Cigarette companies deny that cigarettes cause cancer. That moved by, by 20%. The cigarette companies lie, moved by 12%. It started at 74%. It was already very high. I want to be part of getting rid of smoking went up by 26% because the brand, as you saw it with the body bags, was designed to make adolescents want to affiliate with it, want to be a part of it, want to rebel by not smoking. I believe you can capture that same thing among youth with respect to gun ownership and gun purchase. I think you can do the same thing around unhealthy foods, but it is not cheap to do. When I entered my job, I did not believe that you could advertise your way out of an epidemic. I still don't, but I think the role of paid advertising is much greater than any of us can imagine, and the times when we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars and it's failed has been because there has not been a laser focus on what the goal is, but rather a lot of politics driving what happens. We have difficult attitudes to change in obesity. People don't want people telling them what to eat right now, but we have the sugar papers on our side. We have um, support for a ban on handguns, but it has been falling. It's amazing. More people have shot a gun than have tried a cigarette. Many gun owners, and they're, they're depicted here in the green, affiliate their guns with their core values. That would be very resistant to change. But when you look at this other set, and you can read them at, at Pew about their gun, their gun surveys, you will see the upper ones are positive things that one would like to see change. The majority of gun owners want to create a federal database to track sales. A majority, 77%, want to close the gun show loophole. Those are the people who have the guns. The NRA is fighting against what 77% of gun, gun owners want. And the attitudes are going in the wrong direction. Every time we have another major uh, uh, attack where multiple people are killed, a mass shooting, in, in 1990, 78% wanted um, stricter gun laws. That's the top line. And by 2014, it was down to 40%. It went from being a very clear majority to, not, not, you know, to just under a majority. These attitudes are movable. And if we could find the right donor, the right person who wants to put the money up, I think we could reframe everything. So just to wrap up, opioids are on their way. There will be an opioid settlement. My prediction is there will be one through this judge, and I predict that most AGs will say, keep your agreement, we want our own. The judge is good, but he's in somewhat known to be a settler, according to the press, and AGs saw what happened with tobacco, and I think those who are trying to do it are going to want to get a very big settlement that is a real solution, and that's durable, and, and lasts over time. And in fact, if the epidemic does not go down, more money will go into it. And if it starts to go back up, more money will go into it, because that really is the way to address it. So they're encouraged that the AGs are starting to talk, and soon after the last day of those meetings, um, OxyContin, Maker, Purdue Pharma stops promoting opioids and cuts its sales staff in half. Why did they do that? They did it to prove that they're part of the solution, not part of the problem. So I'm going to move ahead because I don't want to take up all the time here and just say that um, this is a battle on many fronts. I think all of you knew that in the state of Florida, if you were a doctor, you could not talk to someone about a gun in the home in the pediatric context. That has been overturned. Efforts are underway to make that a federal law. California has 
warning labels on guns? Wouldn't it be nice if we had them on all guns? And then just to wrap up, I'm missing an entire focus of this having to do with preemption, but I will simply say this, the, 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 the tobacco industry relied heavily on not having to protect itself in every county and every city, and the way they did it was to preempt, to have preemption over key policies at the state level, so they just had to work in 50 legislatures. They got to a level of about 47 of all states, and now they're back down to 13. They have been beaten back. We shouldn't let the sugar-sweetened beverage industry get to the point that they're controlling 47 state legislatures, but that is their goal. So in summary, using a tobacco MSA-like strategy is complex and takes time. It's easier to do when the industry involved is clearly operating against the public interest and proof is available of criminal activity. It is also much easier to do when public opinion is in support of it. Tobacco use has slowly shifted from purely a personal responsibility issue to an issue with corporate misbehavior dimensions that influence public opinions in ways that support policy change. Smoking has declined 66% from 1960. A large portion happened in the last decade and it's been cut in, cut in half. And for youth, it's down to the lowest recorded levels. Opioid, opioid use and deaths are way up. Obesity is largely flat. Gun deaths are slightly up for homicide and flat for suicide. For a gun-focused MSA to occur, a substantial shift in public opinion must occur, sufficient to motivate elected officials to change policies. Maybe an aggressive health and all policies and MSA style approach can also change the trajectory of these epidemics as it did the tobacco epidemic. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm wondering if, you're, if, if the approach that you're suggesting uh, is harder for industries that are more mixed. So it, it, se it feels a little bit easier for tobacco. Tobacco is bad. They're evil and all that. And so, uh, but uh, we right. have food industry that covers, maybe the food industry has some healthy foods too. Uh, mm -hmm. We have the alcohol industry, which claims health benefits even though there probably aren't any and they're spending a billion dollars um, on, in their latest campaign and then um, even it might even be more controversial the coming marijuana industry which is an addictive product and, and is going to cause um, uh, people are encouraging folks to replace opioids with another addictive product and it causes car acts car fatality auto crash fatalities <coughs> but it's got some benefits too, right? There are cannabinoids that are gonna be quite beneficial. Mm -hmm. So for those industries that, ch that I think are sort of yeah. big ones, yeah. is, is this a uphill, too, too much of an uphill battle or can you do piecemeal or? Well, I think, I think it, it is an uphill battle, but it, remember it was an uphill battle for tobacco because tobacco employed many people. Tobacco provided massive tax rec revenues to states and in some cases localities and the federal government, not so massive, but they, there is a federal excise tax. Um, and they had a bottomless pit of money and still do with which to um, make people comfortable with them. So they were a formidable challenge. Um, and I, I think that if you wall off the population and the component product within a line. I actually think sugar sweetened beverages is a great place to start because it's it's without nutritional value, it's harmful to health, it's a driver of the obesity epidemic. Um, it, there are no warning labels on it, and there probably should be. And obviously, that's not going to happen at the federal uh, government level without a massive change in, in public attitude. And the people who are most adversely affected by sugar-sweetened beverages are precisely the people who don't understand that it's not something you pour in, the, in your baby bottle and say, here, you know, have a Fanta. It's like orange juice. So it's, it's got a lot of similarities to the socio-demographic uh, predatory aspect that t tobacco became as the more highly educated quit in droves over the first 20 years of the beginning of the decline. 
Um, and I think you can tell a story with that, and I don't think it's a pretty one. And if you could ever get access to the documents, which of course is key, and a whistleblower or someone like the, the gentleman who packed up documents and, and sent them to Stan Glantz, uh, which is why Legacy put $15 million into an endowed document center there, because when those got there, uh, the company sued and got an attempted to have an injunction, and UCSF and the entire UC legal system fought them, and it cost them a lot of money. And so to me, there was only one place to put those tobacco <coughs> documents, which we became responsible for finding a home for. Um, that's now got the sugar documents. They're developing a pharmaceutical and a gun repository using different funding streams, though they can technically use Legacy's money for opioid because it's part of all drugs and the MSA says all drugs. So I think there's a way in. I do think it is harder. There is redeeming value for food, broadly defined. There may be some redeem redeeming value for alcohol. I'm not as aligned with some of the comments you made about marijuana worth the side conversation because I've delved into uh, the data on traffic fatalities and finding traffic, attribu traffic fatalities attributable when you're not using the measure of hair, which is a 30-day. When you're not doing that, which is obviously not measuring a proximal um, use of marijuana to an event, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack, sort of like finding a, a, you know, a marijuana attributable fatality. I'm not saying marijuana is a good thing. I'm just saying in, in terms of a broad public health harm reduction uh, approach, you know, one might put it in a different place than some other things. So, but. I thought it was very effective. It, it got taken down, and I'm wondering if you could shed some light on it. It was essentially some kids playing on a basketball court, yeah. and one of them was smoking. And the other kid says, oh, I love playing against Jimmy because he smokes, and he can run down the court like once, and then he's coughing and wheezing, and it just sucks yeah. to be him. And I thought it was it was similar message to the bus, but they yeah. weren't yeah. – they, they, they were – they weren't ma making it something that a kid would want to do, and I'm. Yeah. So, so it's it's interesting. Um, I, I was I was involved in 1994 in convening top marketing experts that sell things to youth, unrelated to tobacco, but all sorts of people, because David Kessler had put 150 million dollars into the proposed new FDA regulations, where he was asserting. <coughs> Uh, jurisdiction over nicotine and calling it a pediatric disease. And when we brought together those marketing experts, really what emerged is a brand, uh, uh, creating a brand to which adolescents would affiliate in which that brand met for them the need states that initiating tobacco use brought to them, which is independence, rebelling against authority figures, being what they consider cool, and that it therefore implied an entirely different brand, one that virtually never talked about health effects, but talked squarely about the industry and the fact that you were being duped and manipulated because kids don't like to be duped and manipulated. So if you were to take that ad that you just described and you would focus test it, it would probably test really well in the age group uh, eight, seven, eight, nine, and then above it, it would actually test poorly. Um, so the industry knew that, and I don't think it was their ad, because if it showed someone smoking, I can assure you it was not their ad, because those ads were shut down by the networks, understandably so. Okay. Well, I don't know if it was <laughs> they showed him smoking. He yeah. might have just been I, okay. suffering, but it was an immediate penalty. It wasn't right. a penalty I get it. Like no, it wasn't like you later. got lung cancer, but, but here's the problem. Uh, kids don't spend a lot of time worrying about their health. They just simply don't. And they don't spend as much time worrying about whether someone likes them or doesn't like them as we think they probably do. And in fact, girls admire the bad guys and the good kids admire the bad guys. So we made bad guys. In fact, the body bag ad was supposed to have been shot with actual adolescents piling up the body bags. But Philip Morris had sent people out to photograph our ad, to, to make movies of our ad being made. And they surrounded the scene with guards. 
and we instead used backup actors that we had. So that was not a youth activism event. It was paid actors. And it led to Philip Morris leaving New York City as its downtown headquarters. They called Mayor Giuliani, asked him to stop our permit. He made inquiries through the School of Public Health where I was still located. He was told by the health department, don't pull that ad. He told Philip Morris he was going to, I mean, nope, don't pull the permit. He told them they're going to go forward and shoot this ad. And they said, then we're leaving New York. And he said, I'll come help you pack. Which was nice, so, yes. Right here, I'm sorry. Well, maybe back there and then you. Okay, I guess I see someone okay. already has a mic. I couldn't I'm right see, here. I'm blinded by the light, I apologize. <laughs> um, so I might have this wrong, but you said earlier that only 1.5% of the money that was gathered in the settlement has been used for smoking prevention in media. Um, first of all, how did that happen? congressionally or whoever was at play in that? And second, with this new opioid settlement that's underway, that's right. what do you think will happen with that in the allocation? So um, it, it was, it's about one to 3% per year, depending upon the year, so it's fluctuated up and down. It happened because the agreement was structured as um, reimbursing the states for expenditures they already made through their Medicaid programs for smokers, in other words, bring home the bacon time. And it, for a variety of reasons, did not bind um, the states to spend the money in any particular way. And in, in fact, 18 states securitized all or some of the money soon after the settlement, which means they went into a, a broker and said, give me 90 cents on the dollar. Actually, Mayor Giuliani did that for the city's share. He just he just took it took a big he put 15 million aside for cessation a year 15 million aside for prevention and then he said I want the rest in a check this afternoon basically so and he got it so um, it was I think a bad decision it's one of the fundamental flaws in the agreement if they had set aside 20 percent we'd have a different situation I would bet smoking in the U S would be among adults. Definitely not in the double digits had that been done. Uh, the tobacco industry didn't want that done. They know what tobacco control does to their bottom line. It, it takes it away. So I am worried about the opioid settlement because if you read the press, the, the judge is saying he wants it to solve the, um, the treatment problem. And I, you know, you're not in the room, and I missed one aspect. These negotiations are secret. They had their first day of meetings. People left the meeting and started to give interviews. The judge got very angry because he told them this is a secret. And so he issued a written gag order to every party, including AGs, everyone who was in the room. So you don't get to see the sausage made. And there are lots of different forces at play. The states want maximum uh, flexibility on their dollars. And the industry doesn't want a blunt instrument taken to it. So you really need um, inspired leadership uh, to have the right kind of agreement come out of it. And I think the right, I personally think the right type of agreement for opioid would have multiple dimensions. But one of them, which was contemplated with tobacco, would be that as the em epidemic grows, so does the fund. So you are disincentivized uh, to be creating uh, opioid addicts willy nilly all over the country because they're coming to get your, your profits. So right now, I'm a, I'm a student in uh, non-communicable diseases, and one of the things that came up recently in, in my recent lecture was that we talked about like uh, Philip Morris like, and, how they, and their role internationally, especially in like development countries like Uruguay yeah. Gray and T Togo, and how they, they're very often that when the governments kind of push back and how these corporate lobbies are often go often sue entire like, countries for That's like right. in, claiming that like, they are hurting hurting their profits and these are ultimately like countries like companies that are like mostly in like you're from developed countries is the most primarily from the US especially yeah I've seen from what I've seen but how would that play out especially in like with the alcohol guns and the opioids I mean if they it would potentially do you think that they would essentially sue other countries if they try if the foreign governments actually tried to block like legislation or hurt their pro and essentially claiming that they were hurting their 
corporate profits? Well, there, yeah, it, it, actually, the answer to that is yes. So if you want to look at it, go, go, uh, just go and read the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, the, the treaty that went down, and it's going to be, it's going to come back in other forms, and it's actually soon a form of it's about to be released. But in that, um, it would be fairly standard that if an industry uh, is employing people in your country and making money in your country, if you take a an action as a government that lowers their profit, you can be required to make them whole and they can litigate. And that actually was viewed as, and, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I, I, I'm 99% sure I'm correct. And actually, some of the language is getting even worse now in the decentralized country by country deal because there's a lot going on behind the scenes, even more than was true for the TPP. So that's an issue. I mean, Uruguay is a, an interesting case because I, I think you probably know Bloomberg ponied up the money to defend them and said to the industry they will change their policy and they can't afford to fight you, but I can. Um, so that was good of him. I would look at the Tobacco Atlas if, if you haven't. There is a, a framework convention for tobacco control that's the first and at this point only global enforceable health treaty and it, the Tobacco Atlas kind of um, tracks the success in various countries along all of the required indices. And frankly, a lot of countries are making enormous success. And in virtually every country, the percentage of smoking is falling, but the numbers are rising where population is rising. So it's equivocal. The, the foundation, what is the connection to going back to where the agricultural of tobacco is being made and uh, collaborating or an alliance with community groups mm -hmm. to, to fight the tobacco company. Do, do you know what I mean? Um, I, I do. It's, it's the hardest place to fight it where uh, tobacco growing is still occurring in the United States. It's stopped in many states, but it's still very much alive and well in the South and it contributes to the economy in the eyes of many, and the companies that are located in the South, Virginia, North Carolina, et cetera, employ many people. They, the politicians are much friendlier to the tobacco industry in the South, one of the reasons why we didn't want our litigation to end up in North Carolina. That said, when North Carolina um, took steps for the public health, and they were not ideal, one of the things they did with the settlement dollars that they received was create something called the Golden Leaf Foundation, which was designed to help people identify alternative livelihoods. And some states have um, developed very creative ways, and Canada as a country has developed very creative ways to move people um, farmers out of tobacco farming and into other forms of agriculture. That said, it's awfully lucrative growing an addictive uh, product. People keep coming back for more. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Please join me saying thank you for being here. My pleasure, my pleasure. Yeah. Just, uh, just a bit of a reception in the back. We'll be here to be around to ask questions. Thank you.